Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Brain Matters webinar series. Entering the third and final phase of the Human Brain Project, we are going to continue with Brain Matters, a webinar series which explores the various issues being tackled by the HPP scientific community. The hour-long sessions focus on different areas of brain research with the goal of highlighting some of HPP's scientific achievements and the state-of-the-art services offered by its new infrastructure for brain research, eBrains. I am Mavi Sanchez Vives. I'm ICREA Research Professor and Leader of Systems Neuroscience at the Institute for Biomedical Research, Auguste Pissunier in Barcelona. And I'm also the leader of Work Packets 2 in the Human Brain Project, which is concerned with networks underlying brain cognition and consciousness. Today, I will moderate the sixth edition of Brain Matters on sensory processing, visual brain circuits. The webinar features Human Brain Project young researchers, as you will see, who recently presented posters at the Neuroscience 2021, the virtual conference organized by the American Society for Neuroscience, by SFN. So I want to welcome our speakers, Tao Yao, Eileen Mergan, Jerome Herpers, and Xiaolian Li. Thank you very much for participating today. Each speaker will have a 10 minute session. Please uh, feel free for all the audience, feel free to write your questions on the chat and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. And if there is some time left, you will be able to make uh, voice questions. But it would be better if you send them now. And please, if you write down your questions, mention the name of the speaker to whom your question is addressed, since we will have them all collected at the end. So, OK, now we are ready to start. Um, and uh, I would like to introduce the first talk. Uh, the first talk uh, will be uh, by Tao Yao. Tao Yao is a postdoc at KU Leuven in Belgium, and he got his PhD at the German Primate Center, and he's working in high cognitive functions. And the poster's title, his presentation will be on neuronal congruency signals in macaque frontal cortex. So Tao, whenever you are ready. So today I'm going to talk about my recent work about the neuronal congruency effect in macaca uh, frontal cortex. The task irrelevant the task irrelevant information may interfere with the task relevant information, the task performance. So the most uh, famous task in the psychology or neuroscience might be the Stroop tasks. So in which the subjects are required to report the color of the, the color of the words and ignore the meaning of the words. So you might find that uh, reporting the color in the incongruent trials, which is the left, the left colon, it's harder than the congruent trials, which is the right colon. This is because the task relevant, the task irrelevant information, for example, the green printed in red, the task irrelevant information is green, it's, uh, it's interfere with reporting the red. So this is called the congruence effect. Basically, the phenomenon that is the worst performance to incongruence than the congruent trials. It's called the congruency effect. So, but this has been, and this, this phenomenon has been uh, investigated with many other tasks. For, for example, the Simon task, the flank task. But what is the neural mechanisms underlying the behavior congruency effect is unknown. So in other words, why the congruent trials, why the people 
are doing doing the why the the subject's performance to the in congruent trials is worse than the congruent trials. What happened in the brain? So this is what I'm going to uh, present in this program in this poster. So to do this, we designed an attentional task. So basically, so the monkey's task is to detect a dimming of a target and the response to this dimming by press a button. So I'm going to show you how the how the how the task is going. So at first, the monkey has to fix 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 to a fixation, and then he will receive a rule, and then after the rule is indicated by the by a vertical or, or horizontal bar. And then after after short delay, uh, during the delay, two uh, two white stimulus are showing. And then we show a queue. And then af after the uh, second delay, we will see a uh, uh, target dimming. So he, in this task, the most important thing is that the target is determined by the rule and the queue. Sorry, I really want to show you my 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 mouse, but I can't. So the target is determined by the rule and the queue. So if it's a color rule indicated by a horizontal bar, the Q the Q of the the, the color of the Q will indicate the target location. For example, if you if the monkey saw a red Q, the target would be at the left side. However, if the monkey saw a pink Q, the target would be at the right side. And this is the rule color, color rule. However, when for the special rule, the location of the Q indicates the target, which means when the target is, when the Q is at the left side, the target would be at the left side. If the Q is at the right side, the target would be at the right side. And the color of the Q is irrelevant. So if the monkey has to ignore the color of the Q for the special rule. So you may find that there are two conditions, which is the congruent conditions and the incongruent conditions. In the congruent conditions, the two rules for a given Q indicate the same target. For example, if the red appears at the left under both the color rule and the special rule they all indicate the target would be at the left side however for the incongruent trials the two rules for a given q the two rules indicate a different target so therefore this because uh because for example if the q if a red appears at the right side in the color rule, the target would be at the left side. However, under the special rule, the target would be at the right side. So these are two rules indicate a different target. So we have the congruent trials just like the stroop task. We have congruent trials and we have incongruent trials. In the incongruent trials, a task irrelevant feature will interfere with the performance because the two features, the location and the queue are indicating different locations, different target locations. So this is our design basically. So uh, let's have a look at the performance. So the behavior, we find a very significant behavior task, the behavior congruence effect, which is the monkey's performance to the incongruent is worse than the congruent in both accuracy and the reaction time. And this is consistent under, for both monkeys. The congruent has a better performance than the incongruent. So we record the single neuron response in FEF from two monkeys when they're performing the task. So let's have a look at what is the neuron response. So for the neuron response, for each neuron we had we, you might know that the, the FEF neuron have a visual response. So if the target 
is in the neurons receptor field. So we call this uh, the task relevant neurons. If the target is in the in the in the in the neurons receptor field, the record neurons are task relevant neurons because they are processing target. Understand under other conditions, so it is indicated by the dash lines. If the target are presented out of the neurons receptor field, these are the record neurons are task irrelevant neurons because they're processing distractor. So what we find is that for the congruent trials, for the task relevant neurons, the response is higher in congruent neurons than the incongruent neurons indicated by the blue, blue and the distance between the blue and the red lines. However, for the incongruent trials, the task is for, for the for the for the task irrelevant neurons, when the target is out of the neurons receptor field, we find that the incongruent trial has a higher response than the uh, congruent trials. So basically, compared to the congruent trials, we find that the task relevant neurons respond lower and that the task irrelevant neurons respond higher in incongruent trials. So oh, this- One minute left, sorry. Yeah, yes. So this phenomenon is, uh, is consistent across two monkeys and also, also con uh, consistent across different rules. And uh, a, a faster summary is that what we want to answer why the congruent trials is easier than the incongruent trials. So we find that the neural congruence effects are carried by the task and the task relevant and task irrelevant neurons and the task the former neurons provide the less signal and the let more noise leading to a lower signal to noise ratio for tar target selection in incongruent compared to congruent conditions in relevant brain areas for example fef in our case and this uh, lower signal to noise ratio leading to a worse performance in incongruent than congruent trials. So basically we, uh, we explained that the congruency effect on, a, on the neural level. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and this uh, work has been pre printed in Research Square. And uh, if you have any questions, you can download. And this manuscript is under review now. So if you, you can download from the link here. And if you have any questions, please email me. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Tao. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we are going to move now to the next talk, which will be by Elin Mergan, who is a doctoral student at the Laboratory for Neuropsychophysiology at the KU in Leuven, Belgium. Her work explores face perception in the prefrontal cortex of macaque monkeys, and her presentation will be fMRI guided electrophysiological characterization of macaque orbitofrontal face patches. Yes, thank you for, for your introduction. So today everybody can see my screen, I hope. Um, so. Today I will show you some results of my ongoing work, which is about face processing in the prefrontal cortex of macaque monkey. So in the macaque monkey, we have uh, three known uh, FMRI-defined face patches in the prefrontal cortex. Um, they were defined by Durst Tsao in 2008. And they were named PO, which is located in the lateral orbitofrontal sulcus, PL in the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, and PA in the prearchuate sulcus. And she also reported that these face patches were not only responsive to faces, of course, but also were significantly modulated for expressive faces. And this is also confirmed by another study, much more recent in 2018, um, by Duhamel and Elodie Barra. So they recorded in the lateral orbitofrontal sulcus 
from over 100 uh, phase selective neurons. And they found that these neurons were significantly modulated as well to the expressive phases. The problem with this, uh, with the few electrophysiological studies that have been done so far on the prefrontal cortex is that they never really uh, know the exact relation between the fMRI um, activations and the actual anatomical location where they recorded the neurons. And so for our study, we want to further characterize these neurons in these prefrontal phase patches while we know the exact re relation um, with, between the uh, anatomical location where we record from and the fMRI um, activations. So to do that, we trained our monkey on a simple fixation task and uh, we used um, a task that is used a lot in our lab for uh, localizers. So basically we present um, 10 different categories of images containing uh, faces, so human and monkey faces, and then other categories such as animals, headless monkey and human bodies, and control objects and sculptures. So based on the fMRI activations, we make a contrast between the um, face and non-face uh, activations, and we, get, we find these face patches. Uh, maybe I can show my pointer. Um, Yeah, so we find the two phase patches in the orbitofrontal sulcus. So I hope you can see it. It's PO. It corresponds with the one that is reported in uh, the previous studies uh, from uh, Durst Sao. But we also find a second phase patch in the orbitofrontal sulcus, which we call POP, as it's a bit more posterior in the uh, orbitofrontal sulcus. So basically, what we do, we uh, once we define these phase patches. We use um, custom MATLAB scripts to calculate the exact locations we want to go to. And then we implant a, a tube on the monkey's skull and we do daily recordings with um, a V probe with 16 channels, so 16 measure points. And um, once we reach the calculated depth, basically we present a set of tasks. So for the first task, I um, present the same stimuli as I use for the localizer. So this way I can measure the response of the neurons to these different categories and I can define them um, as being phase selective or not. And what I find on a, on, in, in this phase patch is that about one third of all the cells is phase selective. So how to interpret this figure is um, these are actually the normalized responses, uh, so the normalized firing rates of the neurons, which are the rows and the columns are the responses to the stimuli within this category. And you can see if you um, average, look at the average response on the population level of these phase selective neurons that they're really um, nicely responding to the faces almost exclusively. And uh, this is the case for the two phase patches. So then what we do next, we keep the uh, electrode at the same depth and we keep recording and we um, show the next task. So what we were really interested in was to look at the receptive fields of these neurons. So we present um, a task where we show a small face of only two visual degrees at 25 positions across the screen. And then if we um, average the, uh, the population response of only the face cells, we see that they actually have a very strong preference for the fovea, so for the center of the screen, with a small contralateral bias. But if we look on the single cell level, actually it's a combination of multi-units and single units, we still see a large variation in, in the sizes of the, of the receptive fields across the different neurons. Next, we also um, wanted to look at these neurons, whether they have um, a preference for specific identities, whether they're view invariant or not. So what we do, we use um, images from Leopold and Murphy. These are 3D images um, of, of monkey faces. They're parameterized and we show them, we show different face views ranging from full to half to frontal view. Um, and an downward and an upward looking face. And for each of these face views, we show eight different monkey identities. So this is a similar figure as um, the slide before. So you can look at the normalized uh, average response and we actually see that 
on a population level, we have the, the strongest preference for a frontal face and for the downward looking phase. However, probably if we would do some cluster analysis, we will see uh, groups of cells with different characteristics. But so actually these, these cells are more view specific than the uh, face, than in the face patches from the, the most interior face patches from the IT cortex. And then finally, um, what of course was really interesting was to look at the responses to the different expressions because that's what has been studied most so far in these prefrontal face patches. But um, contrary to the study I showed in my introduction, we wanted to control more the, the low level features of these images because in the previous study, they didn't care about the background, the luminance, the angle of the head, the identities. So we wanted to keep as much um, fixed as we could. So same background, uh, same identity, same luminance, et cetera. And uh, we only use three different expressions. So a fear face, a threatening face, and a coup. And then, of course, as a control to neutral face. So again, similar figure. Um, oh, of course, uh, I have to say something else. Um, so for each of the expressions, we also here included the different um, face views. But in addition, we added for the frontal view, uh, we played a little bit with the height of the eyes to see if there was an effect as well on the height of the eyes. So very surprisingly, we actually don't see any effect for the expression. Um, this is really contrary to what they say in the literature so far, but we are, we've tested this in two monkeys already and get similar results. Um, but what is coming back, as in the previous task, we see <clears throat> a preference again for the frontal face view and for the downward looking face view. Um, irrespective of the different expressions of the monkey. And this is the case for both face patches. So to just give you a, a short overview of, of the findings we have so far. Um, so we find that about one third of the cells are face selective and that they have a very strong preference for the, for the space in the, in the fovea. Um, the, cells are less view invariant than the most anterior face patches from the IT cortex. And yeah, of course, the, the most surprising result is that we don't really find evidence uh, for emotion sensitivity. So that rounds up my conclusion. I uh, just want to thank everybody um, that helped me with it in the lab. So yeah, if you have more questions, you can always uh, ask them in the, in the chat box. Okay, thank you very much, Elin. You, I didn't have to tell you one minute left. You were very well on time. So uh, thank you very much. I want to remind the audience that you can write down your questions uh, now in the chat and please indicate who they are addressed to. Okay, so now we will move on to the next talk. The next talk will be by uh, Jerome, Herpers, who works at the Laboratory for Neuropsychophysiology at the KU Leuven, where he studies the effects of artificial stimulation of the ventral tegmental area on visual plasticity and behavior. And um, he's going to tell us about his work on pairing a visual stimulus with microstimulation of the ventral tegmental area increases neural responses on the short term in higher order visual cortex. All right, so I will break down the, the long title a little bit. Um, what I did was electrically stimulate the ventral tegmental area. That is a uh, dopaminergic area in the midbrain. It normally responds to um, to reward, to reward prediction error. So if reward is greater than expected. So now we did this artificially with microstimulation. We uh, induced, so to say, uh, reward signals. And we did this while uh, presenting a visual stimulus, so a picture. And this increase, uh, led to an increase in the neural responses uh, in higher order visual cortex. So uh, studies before have shown that uh, VTA-EM, so electrical microstimulation of the VTA, 
uh, that that can increase uh, the spiking activity and the fMRI uh, activity um, in posterior inferior temporal cortex. Uh, with this um, paradigm, uh, the monkeys had to respond to a color to either green or red and make a response based on the color. And a color uh, task was meant to draw attention away from uh, a grating that was presented in the lower visual field. And one uh, grating orientation was paired with stimulation of the VTA. Uh, so one orientation in one location was paired and other locations and orientations weren't. Um, and um, what's important here is that uh, there were always longer periods of VTA uh, EM stimulus pairing. So uh, the effects that I show here, uh, they are the result of weeks of stimulation. And uh, uh, with fMRI, um, they have shown that in PIT there is increased uh, activity for the Baird uh, grating orientation, and also uh, on a uh, cellular level with multi-unit activity, I've shown that um, the orientation paired with uh, VTA stimulation uh, resulted in higher uh, in a higher firing rate for the cells in posterior inferior temporal cortex in PIT. So this was all over a longer period of uh, stimulation. So this time we asked uh, what would happen uh, on the short term. What if we uh, record in PIT uh, the blue squares and then interleave that with VTA EM uh, multiple times. Uh, again, with uh, multi-unit unit activity, um, and we used uh, fractal images, as you can see here. Uh, during recording, four fractal images were shown, and during uh, VTA stimulation, uh, two images were shown. Uh, so there was a stimulated one, a control uh, fractal, and two dummy fractals, the gray ones. They were presented during uh during the recording but not during stimulation so they were not presented and not stimulated uh, in the vta em epoch um this is what the uh, mean response over the recordings looks like so in general you can see that the uh, response is going down for all uh for all conditions but uh well, uh, what stands out is the uh, steep decrease for the control, uh, yeah, for the control fractal. And uh, this was, uh, for both monkeys, it was the same pattern. However, these are the mean responses, so you can't really say anything uh, about uh, separate neurons. So um, we had to look at the selectivity per neuron and uh, we plotted the per neuron uh, the response for the stim fractal minus the con fractal uh, on the x-axis uh, pre-stimulation uh, and post-stimulation for the first epoch this is uh, we plotted it on the y-axis and um, what you can see is that the intercept so the point where the regression line crosses uh, zero is above zero. Uh, and this occurred for the stim minus con fractal pair, but not for the dummy one minus dummy two fractal pair. See the uh, intercept is uh, true zero. And um, yeah, when combining both monkeys, uh, this, uh, consistent results uh, persisted, of course. So we did this for every recording epoch. So again, uh, every time it's pre-stim, so the first recording epoch versus two, versus three, versus four, versus five, and six. And you can see that the intercept 
uh, stays above zero uh, with three spikes. So that means that there's an increased activity for the stimulated uh, fractal compared to the non-stimulated fractal. And this effect was not observed for the dummy fractals. Um, yeah, this increase was already present after one VTAEM epoch, but it did not increase uh, after subsequent VTAEM epochs. Um, finally, we were curious whether this result, uh, whether this effect uh, was present early in the response or maybe if it was a late effect. Um, so we did a sliding window over the response of 50 milliseconds in steps of 50 milliseconds and again did the same regression as in the previous slide and this shows that the effect is already present um, after uh, 5200 milliseconds so this bin is 5200 milliseconds there already the effect is significantly greater than zero and it persisted as long as the stimulus was shown and this was uh, consistent over monkeys. Uh, in monkey two, it's uh, a little bit uh, earlier than in monkey one, uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty consistent. And then finally, we did a uh, correlation. Uh, we calculated correlation coefficient per uh, 50 millisecond window. And also there, the correlation already uh, is very much present after 50 milliseconds, so 50 to 100 milliseconds. Um, to conclude, uh, I've shown that pairing a visual stimulus with stimulation of the VTA increases responses uh, of BIT neurons uh, to the paired stimulus already after 20 minutes uh, of stimulation. So that included around 60 uh, stimulation events. And um, we did not see an increase of the effect after uh, subsequent epochs in the session. So only after the first, there was an increase in firing rate, however, not uh, subsequently. And um, the early latency effect. So it was already present uh, 50 to 100 milliseconds after stimulus onset. And this means that uh, it's more likely to be a, a local effect or a bottom-up effect uh, than a top-down effect uh, like attention. So it's probably uh, unlikely to be attention uh, caused by attention. All right, that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, Jerome, thanks very much uh, for your presentations. For your presentation and um, uh, I think then is a time to move to our last presentation by Chao Lian Li and um, uh, Chao Lian is a PhD student of neuroscience um, at the laboratory for neuro and psychophysiology at KU Leuven her research focuses on brain studies particularly using high resolution fMRI to better understand high cognitive functions. She earned her BS in physics from, from the Beijing Normal University and her master in statistics is from KU Leuven. And uh, the presentation will be about submillimeter fMRI reveals an extensive and fine grain SIM processing network in monkeys. So good afternoon, everyone. Today I want to talk about uh, the SIM networks. So previously study shows that uh, the SIM network encompasses three to maximally five cortical regions in humans and monkeys. Here we study the functional architecture of SIM selective errors using centimeter resolution monkey at my. We used the, the implanted face array receive coils developed in our lab to achieve the 0.6 millimeter isotropic voxel size. This technique allowed us to reliably realize the muscle scale structures in MACAC V2 and 3 Tesla. 
we performed two experiments using entirely different stimuli aimed to control several high and low level features, including the familiarities and the spatial frequency. Here are the same bias activations obtained in experimental one. Our high sensitivity FMI approach yielded more widely distributed scene bias activations than previously, and they are remarkably consistent across hemispheres and subjects. All the activations, including even the very small ones like in ASPD, are bilateral restricted to the cortical ribbon and uh, remarkably consistent across subjects. Our next question is, are these errors really seen selective? Here we calculated the T values between every seen and non-seen conditions across the two experiments and we displayed only the weakest T values. So there are 11 patches for selectivity for both familiar and unfamiliar things. They are distributed all over the cerebral lobes and are surprisingly elaborated in the frontal lobe. Five additional patches show the scene selectivity only for the places familiar to the subjects. Here are the average time calls for each of the 11 calls in selective patch. Although only one twelfth of the entire data set were used, higher response for scenes in this red and the orange colored blocks are quite apparent. Next, we conducted a FC analysis using the scene Royce and high resolution resting state at my data. FC was estimated using the partial correlations. A hierarchical cluster analysis suggests that the scene and body patches form the two largely separated systems. And that both systems can be further divided into two subgroups. The core scene celebrity patches forms uh, uh, a functional interconnected network and uh, they are largely separated from the body network. Lastly, we examined uh, the functional relevance of the instrument sync scene network connectivity. Specifically, we correlated uh, the voxel-wise sync selectivity within each of the causing errors with its voxel-wise FC fingerprint calculated from each of these seeding errors. Significantly positive and negative correlations are indicated by hot and cold color separately. There are more stronger um, connectivity selective couplings exist uh, from the seeds belonging to the SYN network. So the strength of the functional connectivity across nodes of the scene network is a predictor of the functional scene response of node belonging to this network. Together, we could uh, conclude that mesoscale monkey at my reveals a surprisingly extensive scene processing network Sync selectivity patches are distributed across all several loops. And uh, finally, whole sync selectivity patches form a functionally relevant and connected uh, network. The whole sync selective network overlaps little with body networks. Mm, that's all. Thanks, for, thanks you for all your attentions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chao Lian. So um, we have a bit more time than originally planned. So thank you. We have here our four young researchers here uh, discussing to some extent a common theme, which is uh, visual processing in the in the macaque monkey. So 
uh, as we suggested, you can post your questions for a specific um, speakers, but uh, I think there can be also common themes where uh, everyone, all of them can contribute to the answer and, and maybe other um, participants as well. So um, I see here in the slide where you should post your questions. Uh, there is this uh, space down here, Q&A where you can write down uh, your questions. We have some there already. And also you can raise your hand. And um, I think um, we should be able to, to hear you. Um, if you raise your hand, you will be given a voice by the, uh, uh, by the coordinators here. And um, well, I think uh, the discussion is open. Uh, I don't think we need this slide here shared. So um, I'm going to proceed uh, with some of the questions that are um, here. So um, I'll have a first um, question here for Jerome. Okay. So uh, Jerome, um, can you tell us whether you have observed any behavioral results of the effect of the VTA uh, stimulation pairing um, during your recordings? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I did not uh, directly look at uh, behavior yet. Um, I have to analyze those results. Uh, but what I did do uh, was uh, present the monkeys with two gratings on the screen and they could look anywhere on the screen um, and then do the VTA uh, stimulation pairing with one of the two fractals and then do the free viewing of the two fractals again. And that experiment showed that um, there's probably a reward association as a result of VTA EM pairing. Uh, so the monkeys looked more at the uh, at the stimulated fractal than opposed to the uh, the non-stimulated fractal. Um, and uh, pre previous work uh, from uh, from Duffel's lab has shown also that um, VTA simulation can increase the sensitivity in uh, discrimination of uh, motion stimuli. So the VTA uh, stimulation was paired with a, a motion cloud uh, at 2%, I believe. So bare, yeah, it's not even noticeable uh, in what direction the cloud goes. Uh, but after, uh, again, weeks of stimulation, uh, the monkey was, uh, the monkeys performed better at detecting motion in the direction that was paired with stimulation. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to take it from there since I have you now answering the question. <clears throat> and this may sound a bit far-fetched for you, but, but is there any um, a potential for this kind of a stimulation to be used eventually in patients? Is there um, any kind of potential uh, application, clinical yeah, application? Is deep brain stimulation in dopaminergic uh, Midbrain areas for Parkinson's, I believe. Um, however, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this would be feasible for for humans in the in the VTA. If it's really necessary, yeah. If it's necessary, the VTA stimulation shows that plasticity and learning uh, occurs after uh, VTA stimulation. So if you yeah, if you want to learn something very specific uh, in a very short time, then uh, it would be helpful to uh, have an extra boost of uh, VTA activity every time you'd need it. However, I don't, I don't really see any application really in a clinical sense for, for a disease uh, where this can be helpful. All right, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, as you know, brain stimulation is a very um, important uh, topic now and is, there are more and more potential applications in humans. So it's, uh, 
Very interesting. So uh, there is a question here for Elin. So great research, thanks. How do you envisage the next steps? What would you want to see happening with uh, your results? Um, yeah, thank you for, for the question. Um, I think there's still a lot I can do and it can go a lot of directions, but um, I think an important thing here is to see why I don't see any effect for emotion, for expressions, because that's what's been out there in, 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 uh, in other papers. And um, we already actually did it in two monkeys. And now we're recording in a third monkey and we're starting to see, I don't know if I should really mention it, but there we are seeing some effect for expression. And so we're wondering whether it has something to do with the behavior of the monkey itself, whether he's a submissive monkey or whether he's a dominant monkey, because the first two monkeys were dominant and he's a submissive monkey. So maybe there is some effect there. Maybe we can study something there, but I think that's quite complicated to do. Um, there's also some other tasks we're recording as a control, like um, I showed in my in my presentation, we're using parametrized uh, images, so no real faces. Perhaps um, it has something to do there that the monkey doesn't really experience it as a real expression. So we're also showing uh, real faces to the monkeys, um, but that's still going on. I'm, I cannot really share um, any results of that. Um, and other, also other tasks like uh, face configuration, whether how how the um, neurons process the face features separately or together, inverted, scrambled. Um, but I think on the long term, besides just um, these passive fixation tasks, it would also be really interesting to see behavioral tasks um, because the orbital frontal cortex is not really known uh, for just. Um, the, the perception, but also for uh, attention and, and decision making. So it would be interesting to also look at behavioral tasks um, and what it, what happens if you interrupt um, the, the, the signal of the neurons when you micro stimulate. I, there is like a lot of things to do and we're still depending on like the results we're getting now. We still have to see where we're going, but yeah, I hope that's already answering some of uh, well, I, I think precisely these kind of comments that that you are doing are the ones interesting also for the listener. Where are the questions, right? Where are um, the the what questions the research open as well? So I think uh, because of course, uh, especially younger investigators, one looks at, at their uh, area of research, which is more restricted to their own question, and then. It's very important always to look also at the long picture, at the implications, at the significance at the larger level and so on. So uh, there is a question here in this sense, along these lines actually for Chao Lian. So do you think um, uh, the SIN network in human is also uh, more widely uh, distributed? So what do you think, uh, how does do your findings relate to what's happening in humans? Um, yes, sure. I think the human cell network should be more widely distributed uh, than previous studies. There's, uh, although not FMI, but already some EEG recordings uh, shows uh, cell networks could have some extension to the frontal lobes. And uh, this year in the SFN, I also saw a human FMI results from uh, Fred Benrick's labs. Also shows that uh, there are some frontal patches in humans and also functional connected uh, with uh, previous uh, temporal and uh, occipital patches. So yes, I, uh, there is a question which is actually very close to one I was going to ask to Jerome as well. So as I said, I think um, a brain stimulation, um, I, I, I mean, um, deep brain stimulation, but uh, also uh, superficial brain stimulation, I think is a, a very interesting and very hot topic. Uh, thinking also in applications in humans and so on. So, uh, Jerome, you recorded uh, from um, in posterior IT, and uh, uh, 
Well, the question is, are, there, are the effects limited to this region? And, and I think this is a very important consideration for electrical stimulation, to what extent uh, one is activating um, a, a restricted region or the effects can be uh, uh, extensive to surrounding regions and so on. So uh, could you comment on this, please? Um, yeah, the VTA projects to the uh, entire cortex, actually. So the signals from the VTA also uh, go to the, the uh, regions that need it. Um, and the effects are not uh, probably not limited to this region. The fMRI study that, that I showed in the in the introduction showed also increased activity in V2 and V4, I think it was. So the effects that I see in PIT can also be caused uh, by feed forward uh, information from, uh, from, from V2 and V3, among others. Um, yeah, and uh, probably uh, the, the information is sent forward uh, yeah, with more spikes per second. So with more, uh, more information about that image is sent forward. So no, I don't think that the effects are, are limited to PIT. However, the research that we've done shows that uh, this region is uh, amenable to plasticity so that it shows the, the most changes or is one of the regions that shows a lot of plasticity. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we hear the young investigators uh, presenting their work and I want to thank all the uh, attendants. Thank you for attending this webinar. Um, uh, some of these uh, um, webinars you are able to watch uh, in the Human Brain Project YouTube channel, you can look for them. And if you have any questions, please contact outreach at humanbrainproject.eu. And the next webinar will be on December 16th, and it will be about cognitive tasks and decision making. I want to thank you all for your participation and uh, i wish you have a, a very good evening so thank you and see you next time bye bye